This is a video with a lot of information, so I'm giving you some uh, index points to the video where you can go straight to the bike you might be interested in. Though I do encourage you to listen to the whole video because it's got, got a lot of information on bikes that you that may be close to the bike you're interested in. So we have road racing bikes, which are going to cover the <clears throat> the full racing bikes for road, uh, racing bikes for track and racing bikes for triathlon and time trialing. And now we have the road sport bikes, which are the longer wheelbase bikes for recreational riding. We have road touring bikes for loaded touring. We have road hybrid bikes, which are the flat bikes that are with a more upright seating position. We have also the road single speed, which looks like a track bike, but also but has a freewheel and brakes. And then we have road comfort bikes, which are the 26 inch sit straight up high handlebar bikes. We have road commuter bikes, which are the old fashioned uh, internal geared bikes and single speeds that, uh, that, we, that we knew from 50 years ago. We also have road cruiser bikes, which are the same old fashioned uh, fat tired bikes of 50 years ago and then we have the off-road categories which are hardtail mountain bikes full suspension mountain bikes single speed mountain bikes and the newer great big fat tire bikes which range in we're calling a fat bike anything that has three inch or bigger tires so i would encourage you to at least uh wait uh until let the video run through the introduction, otherwise you won't understand what I'm talking about in the video. So let the, let this video run until the first uh, index of the road racing bikes. Okay. Hello, and welcome to another bicycle video dispelling more myths. And I think this is going to be a much more clear and understandable video for the recreational cyclist. And again, this, this video is intended for recreational riding, but I'm going, but uh, as I describe the different bike designs, I will be uh, including racing bikes. Because people like to use racing bikes for their recreational riding, I have included these bikes. But uh, this should clear up the confusion about how a racing bike and a, a racing bike used recreationally is not, uh, is not really all that uh, much use. Uh, people, are, people got real confused on the weight scam video because of the, uh, the intent of what the bike was purchased for. So not only are we going to be using racing bikes, we are going to be using uh, I'm going to be listing all of the bikes and their design purposes. So as we look at this, uh, this uh, very expensive, very beautiful design Kestrel bike with its aerodynamic zip wheels and everything, I don't know what this bike costs. Um, um, I'm sure it must be up around 5000 or more dollars. It's, it may be more. It doesn't matter. Uh, I have this bike pictured because we are simply looking at a bike that is very specifically designed for one purpose. And when we try to use these racing bikes for different purposes, all of a sudden, all the technology, all the work that the engineers and research and development did, the recreational cyclist climbs on and uh, doesn't uh, really take advantage of any of it. So before we get started here, I'd like to uh, discuss the design and purpose generally, and then I'm going to get into very specific bikes. I'm going to have a picture of each kind of designed bike and what it was really designed for and who it was designed for. So the design and purpose of the bike is as listed here. It's a good, des good design is the success of the intent of the designer at the end of the assembly line. And that means the designer cho chose the correct tubes, the correct tube uh, uh, 
uh, the correct tube thickness. In the case of carbon, they chose the, the correct uh, wrapping and which way it was wrapped and how, how the carbon was built up. And it includes how on, uh, on uh, aluminum, steel, and titanium, on the assembly line, how are they being welded together or more accurately uh, either TIG welded or uh, brazed, how these tubes are being brazed together and what kind of quality you're getting off the assembly line with the design of the tube and the skill of the uh, assembly. So with design, people get confused. They're going, well, this material is the best. If you want a great bike, you buy a carbon bike. And that's just not true. Design begins on the on the uh, on paper and depending on the skill of the designer and the material they're familiar with designing they will be either successful or fail in designing a good bike the people that are going to fail are the ones who are designing uh, bikes that they in materials that they're not familiar with they will need a long a long time many years of designing and testing before they can come up to the same level as an experienced designer in that specific material so if a if a designer is uh, is highly skilled in steel bikes and now they just now they decided I'm going to design carbon all the design uh, experience they have isn't going to do them much good for carbon. They're going to have the engineering and they're going to know how to test it but it's a brand new material and they will have to do a lot of research and some guessing as they design. Now if they hire in experienced consultants of course that will help. We have no way of knowing who is designing it and how much experience they have. All we know is the completed bike. When we hop on the completed bike, how well it was designed will come to light. And the design has to do with purpose. Now, if the design was to make a very fast racing bike for very powerful professional riders, and that's what they get, that's good. Maybe the design is to use lower quality tubes to design a very inexpensive bike that still rides well. So the, their design purpose between a carbon racing design and just an aluminum inexpensive bike design requires almost the same amount of skill. You still need a lot of skill to use a lower quality tube and come up with a, a design that will function well even on a $350 bicycle. So we have design and purpose. And if their purpose is to design a comfortable bike using steel tubes and they're successful, that's great. If their purpose is to design a carbon lightweight racing machine and they are successful, that's great. But the material that the bike's made out of has absolutely very little to do with the, with the end product as far as you need to know what it was designed for and then you need to test ride it to find out if the if the intent and purpose of design was successful all the way through to the end of the assembly line so here we go this is a very important we have to go through this uh, these three points here because these three points actually define what the purpose of the bike is as well as the design. So this is something you can see in the specifications and you'll have a better idea of how a bike is designed. So there's just I've kept this fairly simple. We have three specifications and almost all bicycles of any quality will include these specifications along with the dimensions 
dimensional specifications of the frame. So the first and most important is the head tube angle. Now the head tube is that short tube where the handlebar, ste or the handlebar stem goes into and the fork goes into the other end. This short tube angle determines much of how the bike is going to handle. So as I go through all the photographs and descriptions of the bicycle designs, I will be talking about the head tube angle. Because with a head tube angle, as it gets steeper, the bike handles faster. For an experienced rider, that's a very good thing. For an inexperienced rider, that's a very bad thing. So racing bikes are running around 74 degrees. This is a very steep angle. And you couple that steep angle with a short wheelbase, and that's one of the next measurements. If you have a short wheelbase and a steep head tube angle, the bike's going to handle very fast. And that means that's, that's good for an experienced rider. I love a fast handling bike because I can keep it going straight down the road easier than a more sluggish handling bike. But for the inexperienced rider, for the beginner, they will not do well on these steep angles. It will take a lot of practice to keep these bikes going straight down the road. And, and keeping the bike going straight down the road isn't something that's always obvious to you. The only way to know if you can handle these bikes is to actually take this bike and put it on, on a set of rollers, which is a training device for training indoors. It uses three sets of rollers. You set the bike on these rollers, and if you can keep this bike on the rollers and keeping a nice uh, and keeping it going straight within maybe two inches, if you're just if you're drifting back and forth one to two inches, you're doing very well. Most people will put this bike on a roller on the rollers and ride them right off the edge. They won't be able to stay on them. That's because their skills have not been developed yet. And what happens is. When you get on the road and you're weaving back and forth, you lose speed you, and you lose, also lose confidence in handling at high speeds. That's why the head tube angle is so important and especially coupled with the wheelbase. The seat tube angle, however, is, is dictating your location of your body over the crank set. Now the seat tube angle on most road bikes and most bikes run around 73 degrees. But as, as we move into other types of bikes, such as time trial triathlon bikes, the seat tube moves way up into the 76, 77, 78 degree angles. And you'll be looking for those kind of angles in probably your triathlon bikes. Now the other angles are 74 degrees, which are, now these angles change somewhat as the size of the frame increases, they have to make some compromises and uh, you will find that uh, some of these angles are, will change about one degree as the bike increases in size or decreases in size from, uh, from the average of a, about a 50, oh, 58 or 56 centimeter bike. So I will be discussing the head tube angle, seat tube angle, and wheel bases all the way through this video because it's so important. The head tube angle pretty much dictates how the bike handles. The wheel base is coupled with the handling also, but also with comfort. And the seat tube angle is how well you're going to be over the crank set. So as we go into our first category, we're going to start off with uh, the racing bikes. The, it does, and because it's, just because it's a racing bike doesn't mean it's an expensive bike. You can spend anything you want on a road racing time trial or cyclocross bike. So we're going to be using three categories. The road racing bikes are the traditional drop bar, short wheelbase, uh, narrow tired, fast handling racing road racing bikes the time and tr the uh, try and time trial bikes will be the traditional uh, 
highly aerodynamic positioned bike with the uh, with the very steep seat tube angles in the 77, 76 to 78 degree angles. And the road bikes will be seat tubes of 73. Road racing bikes will be 73 seat tube and 74 head tube. And the cyclocross, which is, uh, which has uh, been around for a long time and cyclocross racing was something that road racers did in the spring to, as for for beginning for the beginning of their training for the year uh, cyclocross racing is still being done so they are still building cyclocross bikes a cyclocross bike is very so very similar to touring bikes and sport bikes that uh, the two can be interchanged the only thing, you know, a cyclocross bike will have room for fatter tires with a heavier tread. And they will be usually longer wheelbase, but, uh, and a traditional cyclocross bike will use the cantilever brakes. The newer cyclocross bikes are, are coming out with disc brakes. Whether they, those are going to be legal, I don't know. They are... UCI is discussing whether these disc brakes are too dangerous to use in racing because of the exposed disc uh, being something that be, you can be cut on in a fall. So I don't know if they've determined that yet. So let's get started and we're going to start in with the most controversial bike of all. This is the Carbon Road Racing Bike. This bike can cost anywhere from around 1500 to, I think they're up around 15000 or more now. So you can spend, you can easily spend $15,000 on a road racing carbon bike. So let's start with the basics here. The basics is the, again, the head, ang head tube angle. Head tube angle 74 degrees. So you need a high degree of skill to be able to handle this bike and keep it going down the road safely in a, in a straight line and keep it going in a straight line for the efficiency of cycling also. It also has a short wheelbase. It uses very th narrow tires and as you can see where the rear tire meets the seat tube, it's, there's only a very little distance. So you can use that measurement between the seat tube and the tire as an indication to know that this is a very short wheelbase bike. The seat tube angle is probably 73 or 72 degrees. Now it all depends on the manufacturer's design and the frame size. So you will need to check out the dimensions and frame angles of this bike before you might want to consider it. So this is the bike that's traditionally used by uh, the pro the pro racers, the Olympic racers, any anybody who's serious about racing buys one of these bikes to race on. Now this video, of course, is still aimed at the recreational rider. So while this bike is very well designed for racing, how well or what advantages does the uh, recreational rider have by purchasing this bike? Now this, you have to understand what this bike's designed for and its purpose. And again, here, what's, what is the purpose? The purpose is racing. So all the R&D and all of the purpose of this bike is designed for racing. And that means racing conditions. And that means sprinting, high power, very powerful riders doing full out, full power sprints on this bike. And that is what takes most of the R&D and... Uh, and that's what most of the money was spent on is in the sprint. Because the, at the sprint level, the bike takes a huge amount of torque and they're trying to make these bikes as light as possible. So they need to reinforce some places and then not reinforce other places that aren't receiving the same amount of stress. So that's what all the R&D goes into is the high level of sprinting and the, and the jumps. You're also doing jumps where uh, someone may jump ahead of you four or five bike lengths and you want to get back in the draft 
So you do a quick little out of the saddle acceleration to jump back up to meet them. Again, this is racing conditions, as well as riding in pelotons or pace lines. Uh, as you ride in pace lines, the yo-yo effect of of uh, being in a pace line where it's continually slowing down and speeding up, this takes a lot of energy out of the rider because they're they're braking to because of slowing down, and then as it speeds up, you you have to accelerate to get back up behind the rider you're in the in the peloton in. So to stay in the draft, you are continually slowing down, braking, and then accelerating. This accelerating back up to speed takes a lot of energy, and if you're on a heavy bike with heavy wheels, this energy. Uh, you're you're wasting a lot of energy if you're if you're using a bike. That's why, again, this is designed for racing, and in and in pelotons, it does very well. It's also in uh, you have the light weight. Most of the light weight uh, in the frame is used for climbing. The least the least amount of weight that you have to carry up the hill, the better in a race. But again, these this amount of weight difference between the high-end carbon bike and a low-tech aluminum bike, there may be only about six pounds. So this six pounds of weight when climbing only gives you about a, I'm, I've been using 10% and that's being very generous. So that means if your 6% grade climbing is at 10 miles an hour on an aluminum low-tech bike, if you spend another 15 grand or 10 grand on one on a 12 or 14 pound uh, high-tech carbon racing bike, you will gain one mile per hour. And that's the only place where you actually gain speed because in the flats, this bike doesn't help you that much. In fact, if you are a low-skilled rider, in the flats, you're actually going to be slower on this bike because of the head tube angle. And then also we're on this bike, we're using very lightweight wheels. Lightweight wheels are very, very necessary in, in acceleration, hard jumps, and sprinting. Again, sprinting is taking advantage of about 90% of the R&D is, is being used for uh, the sprint. You need a very strong bike for strong riders in a sprint. And a lightweight wheel will come up to speed much faster than a heavy wheel. So again, when I say much faster or these bikes are incredibly fast, we are talking only a mile an hour and we are talking microseconds at the finish line. So here those are the racing conditions that these bikes are designed for. So when you buy one of these bikes to ride recreationally you're not taking advantage of any of these things other than the climbing and a little bit of the acceleration. So the, the technology is designed to save a racing cyclist maybe a half second in a sprint. Maybe they would gain a half second in a sprint over a low-tech aluminum bike. Now, a half second in a sprint is a huge advantage. So if you're losing a race by a half second and you're riding a low-tech 21-pound aluminum bike, you should really, if you're serious about winning, you should be switching to one of these high-tech carbon bikes. Now, for recreational riding, what does that half second mean? It means nothing to a recreational rider. For one, they don't even have the power of the racer. So they can't take advantage of all the strength and R&D that they put into this frame because they don't have the strength to even use, you know, they don't have the power to uh, even use that technology. And, of course, in recreational riding, all you're doing is constant speed. Now, there may be training in that, but... But that uh, all we're talking about here is recreational riding at a constant speed. So if you're at a constant speed, the lightweight wheels and lightweight bike doesn't do anything. In fact, if you're a low-skilled rider, the lightweight wheels will actually be a disadvantage to you. If you don't have a good smooth pedal stroke that runs through at least you know, 170 degrees of the of the 360 degrees of the crank set rotation, 
If you don't have a smooth pedal stroke where you're going powering down, pulling through the back, pulling up the back, pulling through the bottom, pushing across the top, if you're not using a variation of these pedal strokes, then a lightweight set of wheels will actually be slower for you on the flats. The, you will do better with the flywheel weight of a heavier wheel if you have a very poor, very short pedal stroke. So actually, again, so here we got a bike with very expensive lightweight wheels that is actually a disadvantage to the beginner low skilled cyclist. So we got a head tube angle where they can't keep the bike going straight. We got a wheel set that's uh, not going to do them any good on the flats. I'm going to actually slow them down. And we have the fit and the fit of the racing bike is very aerodynamic. So if you're even a slightly overweight, if you're carrying 10 pounds extra on your belly, you will not even be able to fit properly on this bike. And you will end up injuring your knees or adapting pedal strokes that are very, very inefficient. And that's why the racing bike does not work out for the recreational cyclist. They simply can't take advantage of the huge amount of technology that was put in there for very powerful, very high-skilled riders. And that, I hope, can is the uh, clears up all that confusion and next uh, there we have a number of different uh, styles and makes of frames so we first we got the carbon and now we're looking at a titanium racing frame with disc brakes uh, titanium doesn't get talked about very much because I think the uh, engineers and the designers are very few as far as working with titanium. I have ridden a titanium bike and it seems to have the properties of steel. I don't know what advantages they would have. I've never done long-term testing on titanium. But again, you're getting a very lightweight bike that has good ride characteristics in the frame. And again, this, this, these frame angles are similar to our racing frame angles. We've got a short wheelbase, a 74 degree head tube angle, and a 73 degree seat tube angle. And now we go to the old steel frames. These are the bikes that we used for many, many years before carbon, aluminum, and the titanium. And steel is still being refined today. There are new steel alloy, or I don't know if they're alloys, but there's new steel products coming out now that have uh, much better properties than what they had before, that they used to have. Now steel was always known as a comfort type bike because the steel is forgiving. It, uh, it isn't very, it, it's not stiff. But again, this comes from design. The design of the tubes use more than one thickness. They use a thicker, they use thicker tubes on the end than they do in the middle. So they have thicker tubes where the where the brazing takes place and then they pair that tube wall thickness down in the center. Now what those thicknesses are is how the bike performs at the bottom bracket. Now the bottom bracket is what takes all the twisting stress during the during the uh, high sprint and jumps and anything that requires power. So the main disadvantage with the steel bikes we were racing on in the old days was bottom bracket flex. They just couldn't get rid of it. When they came out with aluminum, the aluminum got rid of the bottom bracket flex. So whether the new steel bikes today have that problem taken care of, I'm not sure. But uh, the new technology steel is is being uh, advertised as something very very special too. No one's uh, no one material is just sitting there going everything that you know this is good enough we're not going to change anything. They're always looking for better materials, and that is the steel racing bike. And then we have uh, the bike I ride, and this is a this is an aluminum low tech bike. I used it as an example and everybody got confused thinking this is the bike you're going to buy. No, this is just an example 
of a bike that costs $700 today that is equipped with very strong parts, a nice riding frame, and it weighs in around 21 to 22 pounds depending on frame size. This makes a very efficient bike for riding up to 100 miles a day and you won't have you won't see any difference between this bike and a $15,000 bike in performance for recreational riding. Recreational riding only. This bike is not going to compete evenly in racing and I think that's where some of the misunderstanding got to. Now of course with climbing you got the, the extra weight of this bike. It's low tech so it's up around 21 to 22 pounds. So you have the uh, the extra weight to carry up the hill so you're going to be about 10% slower on long climbs. But again, aluminum technology, this is uh, this is uh, more low tech. New aluminum technology is they're building bikes just as light as carbon, just as stiff and as strong. So we have carbon, we have titanium, we have aluminum, and we have steel. And depending on how they're designed is how well they're going to get a bike. And we are still wondering what the longevity of these bikes are. I usually crack a frame about the 20 to 25,000 mile mark. And that would be either steel or aluminum. I've not put 25,000 miles on a carbon bike or a titanium bike. I don't know what the longevity is on these frames. But again, you don't want to usually don't want a bike that lasts more than 5 to 7 years because technology passes it by. So it's nice to have a bike that you only spend $650 on, use it for 7 years, and then pick up on the new technology when it comes out 7 years later. And again, we're talking recreational here, not racing. Racing, you're going to want to take advantage of new technology every year. And that completes our road bike. And now we're going to move on to the triathlon time trial bikes. Now these bikes are, are certainly racing bikes. They're designed for racing, and they are designed to be the most aerodynamic position of the rider that you, they can possibly get. Now if you're flexible enough and you're in good enough condition you can use one of these bikes for recreational riding because these are designed for a constant speed so these bikes do very well as a recreational bike if you want to ride as fast as you possibly can ride now how these bikes do in long climbing I don't really know I've not uh, ever owned a triathlon bike I don't know how the 78 degree seat tube that puts you much farther forward on a crank set and these handlebars and these low these low aero bar positions how well that does in climbing how well it does out of the saddle climbing how well it does in saddle climbing but these these uh, time trial bikes can be used for both recreational and and uh, racing so actually if you're going to buy a high you know if you, you wanted a high-end bike and you wanted to go as fast as you possibly can recreational riding this would be a better choice than a road racing bike in fact for the money you could buy a more inexpensive road racing bike and one of these and still probably end up spending less than you would on one high-tech road racing bike and then you could have two bikes with two different kinds of positions where you could change from day to day, which is very, very beneficial if you're riding a lot of miles. And now we're going to finish up with the last racing bike. This is this is a picture of a very traditional diamond frame cyclocross bike. The only thing that's not traditional on this bike is the straight blade forks. Again, I don't understand straight blade technology. We need curved rake forks for a comfortable ride. And this bike is designed to be ridden on-road and off-road for cyclocross racing. There's still uh, Cyclocross racing is still going on today. Uh, it's, uh, nobody's using cyclocross bike, bikes in, or very few people are using cyclocross bikes in mountain bike racing because the mountain bikes are much 
much better designed for off-roading than these bikes are. These bikes are designed for cyclocross, which is a lot of riding, a lot of carrying your bike over obstacles or running up hills. If you're not familiar with cyclocross racing, uh, you won't understand what this was designed for, but if you research cyclocross racing, you will, you will begin to understand. Now the design on this bike uses a longer wheelbase. As you can see, there's more space between that tire and the, and the uh, seat tube. Also, this uses bigger, f bigger, larger tires. So as the tires get larger, the, the wheelbase is the same, but the tires will, you know, if you're, if you're using that gap space to judge wheelbase, as tires get uh, larger and taller, the wheelbase is the same, but the tires get closer to the seat tube. And this uses a, a laid back 72 degree head tube angle. So it handles better off road. And it's using the more typical 73 degree seat tube angle. So you, you got your positioned over the crank about the same, but uh, you are looking at a bike that's uh, has more relaxed geometry in the steering and a longer wheelbase. So they're trying to get that vibration comfort in the bike. And of course they're building this with heavy duty wheels capable of running wider tires. And you and the brakes on here are the traditional cantilever where today a lot of cyclocross bikes are getting the disc brakes. But again, disc brakes may become illegal if they are deemed too dangerous. So we're in the transition between uh, uh, the brake uh, racing with uh, disc brakes or cantilever brakes. But this bike actually is very, very closely designed to touring bikes and to sport bikes. This is basically a sport bike. There's really not much difference other than if you see the cables running across the top of the top tube, they're up there to stay out of the dirt of where the cables are normally running under the bottom bracket. So normally you would you would be uh, running your your shifter cables under the bottom bracket to the front and rear derailleurs. And in in this case, because it's designed for off road, it's running across the top and down to keep the cables cleaner. And that is about the only difference between a cyclocross bike and a touring or sport bike. Now the touring bike will be more specific in the uh, when we move on. And that completes the uh, racing bikes. I hope you understand now what racing bikes are designed to do. Okay, and the last bike I have here for racing is the traditional track racing bike. This bike has no brakes, one gear, and no freewheeling. So the crank continually goes around as the bike goes around. There's no coasting on a bike like this. The, the uh, crank is always moving, your legs are always moving. This is the bike that's used on a track, or a wood track, or concrete, or velodromes. Now some people are actually using this bike on the road, which I highly don't recommend because all you have is a, is a first of all, a very high skilled, it takes a lot of high skill to ride these on the road, and the only way to brake takes a lot of leg strength because you have to stop pedaling and hold the bike. And the reason these bikes don't brake well is all you have is a rear brake. All you can do is skid the rear tire to stop. Where uh, if you want to use one of these single speed track bikes on the road uh, in the next category, there is a recreational use bike that has front and rear brakes on it and freewheeling. Much safer to be used on the road. So let's move on to the sport bikes. And the sport bikes are going to include the traditional drop bar bike, like the cyclocross bike, road touring bikes, which are designed for carrying panniers and loads, where you're going to do overnight camping. And then we have the road hybrid now, which is a sport bike that doesn't use the drop bars, it uses flat bars. So a beginner may feel more confident on a flat bar for handling. Also flat bars are much more controllable going down long 
long mountain grades because uh, you have a much stronger grip and, and better uh, ergonomics to the brake levers than you do on a road bike. And flat bars are, uh, give you the opportunity to, to ride in a more upright position. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the first one here. Here's the first sport road bike. There's very few of these bikes around. And you can see this is one of the better designed or probably probably has the best design of a sport road bike. You can see it has a long wheelbase. Distance between the tire and that seat tube is quite a bit longer than those racing bikes. It's um, This is using a 72 degree head tube angle which gives you that more relaxed steering geometry and this one actually has a curved rake fork instead of the straight blade fork and I and with proper design properly designed curved rake forks um, you get more comfortable ride this one also comes with disc brakes which is which is uh, uh, is, which is very nice for any bike disc brakes can't be beat on road bikes or mountain bikes or any bike they are just a better braking technology. So here we have our first sport road bike using a traditional 73 degree seat tube angle, a more laid back, easier handling head tube angle. The traditional dropped road bars though, we're still staying with the road bike type uh, drop bar, but it's quite a bit different than a racing bike because this is designed to be more comfortable with a longer wheelbase, curved rake forks, and hopefully it's the, the tubes have been designed for more comfort. So this is a, a, just a good bike for riding a long distance on, uh, on rougher roads that uh, you would need a more comfortable bike. And let's move on to the next road sport bike. And the first thing you'll notice on this bike is the fatter tires. And as the tires get fatter, of course, they get taller. So this is a road sport bike. Uh, which uh, the Randonneur racers are are now this looks like a Randonneur bike now the Randonneur Randonneur long distance uh, riders have gone to a wider tire they're finding that the wider tire at the slower speeds that they ride which is 17 to 20 miles an hour cruising speed these slower speeds over over chip and seal and uh, cheese grater type roads are an actually a faster tire and certainly much more comfortable than the 25 millimeter one inch racing tires. So here we have a perfect example of a Randonneur bike or a nice sport bike that uh, is, should be really comfortable over any road surface and, uh, and be actually faster than a road racing bike for long distance riding. And for long distance, we're talking 200, uh, 800, 1,000, 3,000 miles. So we have a laid back head tube on there with 72 or 73 degrees. We have a curved rake carbon fiber fork, and we have a longer wheelbase, even though it's disguised. As you can see, the tire is pretty close to the seat tube, but because again, because the tire is so tall, the uh, the wheelbase is actually longer than it appears. So depending on how this bike is designed, it should be a very good sport bike for all different kinds of road surfaces. As you can see, the difference between this and a cyclocross bike, basically the only difference is the disc brakes. And if you watch, if you look at the cables again, the shifter cables are running underneath the bottom bracket instead of going across the top tube. And looks like they've in the for the disc brake they've actually run the disc brake cable down underneath also. So now you have a nice clean frame on the top with no cables, and this is fine for the road. And we move on to the next road bike. This is a road touring bike. This is a de bike designed for touring. Uh, especially if you're going to load this bike up with panniers, if you're going to load it up with weight and baggage, tents and sleeping bags. If you notice the front fork, there's a little black dot slightly above the hub, in between the hub and the, uh, 
and the headset. That little black dot is a brazon for a low rider rack. And that's very important when you're going to load your bike up with panniers. You don't want a high center of gravity on the front for your panniers. These low rider panniers ride way down by the hub and they provide a very good handling bike for a bike that's equipped with panniers. So you have the traditional high mounted panniers on the back where you might do, well you'll probably put your sleeping bag and uh, tent on the rack and then the panniers will have uh, space for luggage and then panniers on the front for more luggage. This bike is uh, constructed out of steel. It has a long wheelbase as you can see and it has a very big curved raked fork that's made out of steel. So this, once this bike is all loaded up it should be a very comfortable bike for touring. Now this is a very traditional touring bike. It's all steel and it's using these cantilever brakes again, same as a traditional cyclocross bike. These cantilever brakes are, uh, it's not something I would recommend anymore. Uh, if you're touring, I, I suggest touring on disc brakes if you're in the mountains. If you're not in the mountains and just in gently rolling hills or flats, then these brakes are fine. Anybody touring the mountains today should be taking advantage, should be taking advantage of these disc brakes with a heavily loaded touring bike. Now with touring, I prefer to use a trailer. With a trailer, I can use any bike I wish. I can, I can pull a trailer with a racing bike, a mountain bike, a, a comfort, it doesn't matter. You can pull it, uh, you can tour on any bike that you want with a trailer. So I find trailer touring much more enjoyable because the bike will handle pretty much as normal. When you're on the flats and you got a smooth pedal stroke, um, the bike will, will uh, pretty much ride as normal. Now as you climb, you will definitely feel the weight as you would in a loaded pannier bike. You will feel the weight of the trailer and if your pedal strokes aren't very even, there will be a slight uh, oscillation of the pull as you're going uphill. So for people that don't like that little bit of oscillation or don't have smooth pedal strokes, they may not like a trailer, but I recommend a trailer, especially for a beginner. It's highly, highly dangerous for a beginner to load up a bike and go touring. While if they, if they use a trailer, it's much, much more safer for them. You have crosswinds that are going to give you a loaded bike problems that the trailer won't. And uh, the handling of the bike is, is, is horrible compared to an unloaded uh, bike. And that's, that's basically our touring. We move on to the next sport bike. Now this, somebody might look at this and say it's a uh, triathlon bike, but I wanted to include this because it's just simply a road bike with triathlon clip-on bars. So uh, this, this is not a triathlon bike because it does not have the forward degree seat tube of 78 degrees. This is using a 73 degree seat tube and a 73 degree head tube. And it's a fairly short wheelbase bike, but it's also slightly longer than a racing bike. So this bike is designed for somebody that uh, wants to use a sport bike and have more positions for their hand. The aero bars give you more positions for your hand. And we move on to our first hybrid bike. Now the hybrid bike, this one is a carbon fiber hybrid bike with disc brakes and a medium length wheelbase. But because this is a carbon fiber race frame that they used on racing bikes, it also comes with a steeper head tube angle. So a real hybrid bike would have a 72 head tube angle, while this one probably has a 73 or 74 degree head tube angle. But it's one of the rare bikes that actually has a curved rake fork. So my guess is this would be a very comfortable bike for long distance sport riding. Recreational riding, of course. and uh, So, with this bike, with the flat bars, I, I ride a number of flat bar, bar bikes on the roads, but all my flat bar bikes are equipped with aero bars. The aero bars give me that third position 
for my hands and my shoulders that uh, is needed for long distance riding. I would not want to ride a flat bar bike where you have just the two positions. If, if you have bar ends, you have two positions. If you don't have bar ends, you basically have only one position. That one position is going to really put a lot of pressure on the hands. So I like to use hybrid bar, uh, on hybrid bikes, I'd like to use aero bars as an additional position. And this would be the highest tech uh, hybrid recreational bike you could buy since it's made out of carbon fiber. Now we move on to the next. This is a more traditional aluminum framed hybrid bike with 72 degree head tube angle disc brakes. You can see the wheelbase is very long. There's lots of space between that tire and the seat tube. It also has a curved drake carbon fi fiber fork too. So this uh, this makes a very good uh, first bike, hybrid bike, for anybody that's uh, that would like to begin road riding, but are carrying a few extra pounds where they can't quite get on the road bike drop bar position. So the hybrid bike, and especially this one, it has an adjustable stem on it, so you can raise and lower the handlebars as you get fit. You can start with a very high handlebar and as you lose weight and get fitter by riding, you can continually drop that bar into a lower, lower position. And of course, the lower the position, the more aerodynamic your body's going to be. And that's how you pick up most of your speed is putting your body in an aerodynamic position. So this is a very, very good uh, hybrid bike. Let's move on to the next hybrid bike. This is a more simpler one. This is an aluminum frame with a curved rake steel fork with uh, very nice, nicely done though linear pole brakes. So this is a very good beginner's hybrid bike. Again, we have adjustable bars, uh, adjustable stem. So you can start with a higher stem height and work your way down into a lower and lower position as you lose body fat from conditioning. So if you're already in condition and don't have much extra body fat, uh, the hybrid bike is a good choice. And so is the sport uh, the sport drop bar bike. If you're carrying extra pounds though, you will not want to go to the drop bar bike first. You'll want to go to the hybrid. If you're carrying a lot of extra weight, then you want to move on to the next category and that is the comfort bikes. And now we come to the last uh, recreational road bike. This is a track style bike. Even though it's not a track bike because this bike has front and rear brakes and you can freewheel on this bike which means you can stop pedaling and coast where a true track bike would be a fixed gear and you cannot stop and coast. The pedals are always going around if the bike is moving. So this is a good safe bike to be on the road. It's also a very simple bike. There's no shifting. There's a, uh, it's, it, it's a, just a very simple bike. And unfortunately, to be able to use a bike like this, you have to be an extremely strong athlete with very good knees and very good health. Um, you only have one gear, you control your speed by either pedaling faster or slower, but if you have any climbing to do, you have to be very, very strong. And it depends on what gear you pick out too. You get to pick any gear you want on the rear cog and somewhat uh, the front crankset gearing. But basically there won't be any low gears for any serious, hard, heavy duty climbing. So if you're doing any climbing or long high headwind into, into high headwinds, it's going to put a strain on your knees unless you're very, very strong and you were born with, with uh, very good knees. So uh, this is a bike only for the very well conditioned, very strong athlete who was given a great deal of strength at birth and great genetics. Now this bike is fine if you live in an area that's flat and you pick a gear that doesn't overload you for uh, for most of the headwinds. 
But it's just a fun bike because it's so very simple. It doesn't get any simpler than this. And that ends our, our sport recreational road bikes. These are comfort bikes used on the road. And there's a number of different uh, types you can choose from. You have the road comfort bike that has a really high upright bars. You have uh, suspension front. Uh, you have front suspension. You have a very upright seating position. You have wide, uh, fat, comfortable tires. And you may have a shock seat post on this too. So this is a very good bike for the beginner rider who is carrying a lot of extra pounds and they're going to start their fitness program and lose weight and this is a you can ride this bike for the rest of your life if you want or you can upgrade after you become more fit the next is the road commuter which is kind of the old style bike it's the same style bike that I bought back in 1969 my first bike that I bought it uses internal gearing three speeds an upright position and uh, the traditional old-fashioned kind of uh, handlebars. It uses a narrower tire, about one and a quarter inch, while the Comfort upright bike is using the uh, two-inch wide tires. And it's a good bike for commuting. And I've I've put uh, many miles on this bike. I I uh, I was comfortable riding this bike over 50 miles. So. You can put some good distance on a road commuter bike. A road comfort bike is still pretty good for 50 miles. If you're getting into headwinds though, you'll have a lot of problems with the upright seating position. It's going to take a lot of energy to push through headwinds in this position. And then, a, and then uh, the last category here is the road cruisers, and that's the kind that uh, we remember from the 60s that they're still building today. It's a single speed. Uh, wide mustache type handle shaped handlebars wide tires and uh, and the chain guards and uh, coaster brakes so let's take a look at the first comfort bike and that is the most traditional comfort bike here this is a this is a bike that's excellent for very heavy riders it uses a 26 inch wheel lots of spokes very strong wheel Two inch wide tires, very comfortable tires. This one has a shock seat post, a very heavily padded saddle. And you look at the handlebars, they're very high up, they're very upright, and we have a suspension fork also. This uses very good brakes, they're called linear brakes, very good, very good stopping power. So if you're overweight and you're carrying a lot of body fat, this is a good position to start in. You uh, you'll be sitting almost straight up. So if you have spine problems, back problems, this is also another good alternative to the road bike and hybrid bike. You'll be sitting straight up. Now I use one of these bikes because I like the sit up straight position. I use and I like to use this as a touring bike, but as your skills would get better, I I added aero bars to my comfort bike so I had another position and an aerodynamic position. Something to consider after you've been riding for a couple of years on this bike and you want to stay with it. And we move on to the next one. It's, the next one's very very similar except this uses what's called internal gearing. This has eight speeds and it's all internally geared. So this is a very simple bike. It makes a very good commuter bike because internal gears can be shifted while you're at a stoplight. So you can change gears without moving on these internal geared bikes. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same as the first one, first comfort bike I showed you. It has 26 inch tires, linear brakes, a very upright handlebar and upright seating position. I was just showing this, this as because there, all, there are alternatives to a derailleur system, and that's the external gearing. Um, these these gearing these gear these uh, external bikes are or external gearing is fragile and someone can walk up and kick it and damage it very easily. Well, this is a very strong gearing system bike. Can't be damaged by other bikes that uh, bump into it in a bike rack or something like that. 
So you basically have two types or three types of gearing. One is no gearing, single speed. One is the derailleur type, external gears, and this is the internal gears. And the internals come in three speed, eight speed, uh, seven speed, and some of the very higher end internals, I think, go up to 15 speeds. Very expensive, but uh, still internally geared. As we go to the next bike, this is a cover bike, and it's very similar to the other two cover bikes. It's external gears. This is a 8-speed uh, cog for a 24-speed bike. It has a suspension fork, 26-inch strong wheels, big old fat 2-inch wide tires, upright seating position. But th this is what's called a crank forward. If you look at the seat tube, you'll notice first there's a huge gap between the rear tire and the seat tube. Also, the angle of the seat tube is very, very laid back. This is laid back to 68 degrees instead of the more traditional 73 degrees. And now the advantage of this is when the seat height is properly adjusted for you, when you stop, you can lay a flat foot on the ground. For a traditional bike, you, when you stop and the seat is, a, is at the proper height, proper riding height, you will be on your very tiptoes or not even be able to actually stop and stay in the seat. You'll have to get off this and straddle the bike to uh, every time you stop. So this bike has a huge advantage of not having to dismount the bike every time you stop. So if you're in town and you're going from light to light, this is a very nice bike. Now the main disadvantage, I have owned bikes like this before. I've owned uh, two crank forward bikes. One was, was so far crank forward it almost recumbent and another one was just like this one with a 68 degree tube and slightly forward. I injured my knee very very badly on a very steep climb on this crank forward so I think the crank forwards put your knees in a disadvantaged position so if you have knee problems or you have weak knees this is probably not a bike for you. You'll have to go to the traditional bike and if you have to make lots of stops, then you'll just simply have to get, you know, get off the saddle and straddle a bike every time you stop. Now, the only way you can get around this, and it's something I would like to try, is to put a, uh, an electric wheel on this bike so that when climbing very steep hills, um, you can get some assistance so that you don't put a strain on the knees. So if you add an electric motor to the front wheel on this one to assist in hill climbing, this can still be a very good alternative uh, bike for your first bike, for uh, very heavy riders, and for riders that uh, are in town that make a lot of stops. That's the crank forward comfort bike. And now we move on to that uh, more traditional bike, a bike somewhat like I bought back in 1969. I bought a three-speed configured like this. It has those those uh, pull-back handlebars. It uses about a one and a quarter inch tire, has a chain guard, and no derailleur system. This is a, a single speed, so it's using a coaster brake. We go on to the next bike, and it's the same thing. We have some fenders. Uh, we have chain guards. Uh, we, this one has caliper brakes front and rear. And we have a three-speed internally geared hub on the rear wheel. So this is a three-speed. This is the same bike I bought back in, well, not the same manufacturer, but same type of bike I bought back in 1969 as one of my first bikes I, I ever purchased. And I would ride up to 50 miles on this bike as a little 11-year-old. So this bike is still viable today, even though it's ex designed pretty much exactly the same as it was 50 years ago. And I always move on to the next one. It's the same kind of bike, except this one comes equipped with front and rear racks. And this one is internally geared with eight speeds. So this is an eight speed internal geared, the same pullback type high seating handlebars. This is a bike designed for a commuter. You can, bring, uh, you can bring a lot of baggage with this bike and sit straight up, be comfortable. Uh, have a, On rainy days, it's going to keep a lot of rain off of you with the fenders, and the chain guard is going to keep you cleaner, too. 
And this is the, what I'm calling the commuter bikes. And this is the fanciest one of the bunch. Eight speed internal gears, fenders, racks, chain guards. And now we move on to the next style bike. This is the cruiser style bike. Uh, this is a this is a bike for very short distances. This is a two three mile down to the store bike, a bike to take to the. This particular bike is an excellent bike for the beach because this this is uses a giant three inch wide tire, and the more wider the tires, the more flotation you can get on the sand. You could probably ride this bike across the sand and actually just ride to your little beach spot and uh, put your towel down and take in some sun. But this main disadvantage with these bikes are uh, they rarely come in more than one frame size. So if you're very tall or very short, you'll be unlikely to get this bike to fit you very well. But this particular bike is a single speed. It has a more laid back seat tube angle, not quite as much as the crank forward it's in between a traditional bike and the crank forward bike so you're not going to quite get a flat foot on the ground now a lot of these people don't even adjust the seat height correctly anyway because they're on such a short trip that they they just simply put the bike seat down to the level where they can put their feet flat on the ground which is of course the improper height for the saddle but doesn't make much difference in a two or three mile ride you would need to ride uh, into the 10, 20 miles and more before that uh, seat height would probably start to bother you. But again, if you have weak knees and, and you have an improperly set seat height, it's not a good idea. So this is the first of the first picture of the uh, uh, the cruiser, and this next picture is again the same cruiser except more traditional cruiser with uh, longer fenders so this will keep you dry chain guard again a coaster coaster brake bike very high uh, handlebars for a very uh, straight sit up position 26 inch wheels like the other one fat tires except this is a two inch wide tire instead of the fatter three inch so this is the traditional cruiser bike that we've seen for the last uh, 70 80 years or more as we move on to the last cruiser bike, again, this is another crank forward. You can see this is a very, very long bike. It's going to handle very, very slow. <laughs> but uh, again, this is a, you'll be able to put the bike seat at the proper height and still be able to put a flat foot on the ground while seated in, and, and when you stop. So this is a very long, very designed to be a very comfortable bike with 26 inch wheels, two inch wide tires, very high handlebars for a high seated position. These cruiser bikes again are not the best choice for long distance. If you want to ride 25 miles or more you may have a bit of trouble with this. So let's move on to our next category and the next category is the off-road bikes. These are the recreational mountain bikes. Now there's no reason you can't use a mountain bike on the road. You can certainly run those off-road tires on the road if you want. And if you're never gonna ride off-road, you can put a, a, fat, uh, a fat tire with, uh, with uh, very little tread, such as the comfort bikes are using. You can put comfort bike tires on a mountain bike. Now mountain bikes again are a good choice. The, the bikes are frames are built very strong so it's a good choice for very heavy riders. So if you're very heavy and you're looking to lose rate, weight, a mountain bike is still uh, somewhat of an alternative but uh, mountain bikes are going to put you in a lower position. You're going to be leaned much farther over so uh, the body fat cannot be as high or you'll need to convert the handlebars to a higher position. So let's start with the first uh, first mountain bike is what's called a hardtail. We have a rigid frame and a suspension fork. This particular bike is a high-tech bike that you might want to use for racing because it's a titanium, it uses a titanium frame. 
But this is basically a traditional hardtail bike. It's using disc brakes, which is pretty much common on nearly every single mountain bike out there now. It's using a triple crank set, and um, this has probably got a 10-speed rear for 30 total gears. Uh, this bike is is a, uh, like I said, it's a traditional hardtail mountain bike, but the hard the uh, mountain bikes are now coming in three different wheel diameters. The 26 inch, the 20, uh, the uh, 650C, and the 29er. Now, according to, they, they started making larger wheel diameters because they felt that the larger wheel was rolling over obstacles easier. And it really does roll over ob obstacles easier. So now they give you three choices in wheel diameters. But for the heavy rider, and I'm only I'm 190 to 195 pounds, I cannot, these, these 29ers are just uh, too weak for me. The 26 inch wheel is very strong wheel because of it's, it's small. So I use 26 inch wheels with 32 spokes and, uh, and a very strong wide rim. So I get very strong wheels on my mountain bike that way. So if you're a very heavy rider, you need to still stick to the 26 inch wheels. Now you can ride the 29s or the 650Cs, but uh, they may not last very long for you. And that's the whole object. The, uh, I'm going to get much longer wear out of these 26 inch wheels than I will out of a 29er. And that's the hardtail bike. Now with the hardtail uh, mountain biking is completely different than road riding. So a lightweight mountain bike can be taken advantage of by a recreational rider. So if a recreational rider wants to spend a lot of bucks on a lightweight mountain bike, they will uh, be able to take advantage of all the technology that is included in a racing mountain bike. Where in the road bike, they, uh, a recreational cyclist can't take, can only take advantage of about 90 or, or about 5 to 10 percent total of all the technology that was put into the bike. Because, because off-roading riding is so different, it's so very different, Uh, you will take uh, you can't because because you are riding because off-road riding is continually uh, breaking around sharp corners breaking and accelerating as you navigate uh, large obstacles uh, breaking into corners and trying to and re-accelerating out of the corner breaking into corners re-accelerating out of the corner into a hill and climbing and all the climbing that you do um, recreational riders can take 100 percent advantage of any racing technology that is put into a mountain bike so that is a huge difference between the mountain bikes and the road bikes if you want to spend money you will actually be able to receive some of the benefits now again these benefits are very very small uh, the difference between a racing mountain bike at maybe 21 pounds and a 30 pound or 32 pound low tech recreational bike. Uh, again, you're, it's going you're going to expend more energy with the uh, the heavier bike. So, what that amounts to at the end of the day, if you could normally ride 20 miles. On the same energy level on a low tech 30 pound bike, you could probably very easily do 25 miles on a high tech bike with the same amount of energy expenditure throughout the day. So, as the miles go up, again, that gap widens. So, if you'd like to do a 50 mile mountain bike ride now, maybe, maybe you could do a 70 mile mountain bike ride with the same energy. So, if you're running out of energy with 50 mile mountain bike ride, all you have to do is buy a lightweight bike, and all of a sudden you can go a lot farther. And it's too bad you can't, this can't be translated to road bikes, but it just doesn't work the same for road bikes. 
So let's like, take a look at the next mountain bike, and of course that is the full suspension bike. This is uh, good for people with back problems, good for, for beginners who haven't developed a skill to use their legs as shock absor absorbers on mountain biking. But it is a skill you need to develop, even with a, even with a full suspension bike. What you want to do is you, you sense the shock through your handlebars, and then you raise yourself off the seat slightly, by pushing harder on the pedals, you know it's not a it's not a stand up and get out of the saddle. It's just a slight raising so that you're not fully weighted on the saddle when you hit when you hit the shock when you hit the bump. And that's the technique of of uh, and the skill of riding a mountain bike off road. Now the full suspension means you don't have to use as much of that skill. So uh, from what I heard from people with back back problems. These are real lifesavers for you if you want to ride off-road. And again, these, these bikes come in the three different tire diameters. And uh, this, is a, this is a traditional, uh, this is an eight-speed cog, so it's a 24-speed mountain bike, front and rear suspension. This one is high tech, so high enough tech to give you a lockout fork and a lockout rear. Uh, it doesn't take that much money to get lockouts anymore, and I would suggest lockouts on front and rear with these bikes, especially if you're going to ride your bike on the road, or if you use you ride your you ride on the road to get two trailheads. A full suspension bike on the road is going to absorb a huge amount of your energy. You'll, as compared to a rigid rigid bike, you will probably lose thirty to forty percent of your energy riding a full suspension mountain bike as compared to a rigid fr front and rear bike. So by locking it out, you will uh, be able to get a lot more energy. Plus you can lock, it, lock in and out on the trail too. You, maybe you don't need the rear suspension on, on, the, uh, on, a more, uh, on a less rougher trail. And then you can practice too some of your skills of mountain bike riding on a rigid rear end or a hardtail. This one again uses uh, disc brakes, and I recommend, highly recommend disc brakes off road. Don't, uh, don't. Uh, it's hard to buy anything else anyway. Even the cheapest uh, disc brakes on uh, on some of the lower level bikes. And when I talk lower level, I'm not talking department store. I'm talking still a good, well designed bike, and that, and that is. Uh, uh, if you're buying Factor Direct, we're talking at least $350, and we're talking maybe $500 to $600 in your bike, local bike shop. The next one is a, uh, is a, is a rigid bike single speed. This one's a 29er. It's a single speed, uses disc brakes, has no suspension. This is going to be a very rough riding bike if you're a heavy rider. If you're a heavy rider, you're not, you're not going to be able to air down these tires very much. And this bike, if you're on a rough trail, it's going to beat the crap out of you. So uh, this is a bike also designed for very, very strong riders. You only have one gear. So you need a you, first you need the skill of a wide range of uh, pedal speeds, because the only way to go faster is to pedal faster. But you're also going to need very to be very strong to be able to climb with only this one gear. So this is a this is a real athlete's bike. It's a, unless now if you mountain bike in the flats, this is this is fine for anybody. If you're in the flats on a on a on a trail that's not very rough, or you're a lightweight rider, uh, this bike will be fine. It's the climbing that uh, demands a very very strong rider. For a single speed off road, and we move on to next. We're starting with fat tire bikes now. This is a fat tire bike I bought this year. This one's using a three inch wide, 26 inch tire, and the rest of the bike is fairly traditional. There's no front suspension on this bike because the fat tires don't really need it. You only need front suspension if you're doing some very big jumps or you're doing some very heavy duty. Uh, Obstacles, very large boulders, very uh, you know big drops of two, three, two or three feet or something like that. 
then the front suspension would be a nice to have. This bike is good for, uh, with a three inch tire, is good for anything up to, uh, up to sand and snow. It's the, I don't, the three inch tires really aren't going to be wide enough for sand. You're going to want to take advantage of the wider tires. And the rest of this bike is traditional. It's using a mechanical disc brake, a traditional uh, eight speed cog for 24 speed drivetrain, aluminum frame, steel fork. This is using a straight blade fork. Uh, the frame stiffness doesn't really matter because the tires are doing all the uh, all the uh, shop absorption that uh, the frame would have to do on a more traditional mountain bike. And then a, this is a fat bike, and the next fat bike is the full fat bike. This one is this one includes front suspension, and this one has four inch tires. And there is a wide variety of diameters and tire widths in fat bikes now. Uh, as far as I know right now, 4.6 inches wide is the widest you can get. But as I speak, they may be working on a five inch tire. I don't know. But the common tire is four inches wide, and you should be able to buy a nice selection of tires today. This is uh, going to be a very comfortable bike on a very rough, rock-strewn uh, trail. Uh, fat bikes are a very are just a very good way to off-road. I don't think people want to race on these now. If you if you're in a mountain bike race that includes deep sand. This bike is going to be incredibly faster, even though it weighs uh, 10 to 20 pounds more than your racing traditional bike. This bike will be incredibly much faster. You're going to float over the top of sand. You're going to float over the top of deep snow. And it's, even though it weighs twice what a racing mountain bike would weigh, it still is going to be faster. A two inch tire, two inch wide traditional mountain bike on soft sand is going to be next to useless. You could probably push the bike faster than you could ride it. So that's the main disadvantage of the fat tire bikes is uh, heavy weights. You're going to end up with a 35 to 40 pound bike. The previous fat tire bike is in between the one I'm riding, the gravity here pictured here, using three inch wide wheel, uh, three inch wide tires is 35 pounds, which is only five pounds heavier than my traditional mountain bike, while this shocked and uh, four four inch tire bike, this one probably is close to forty pounds. Between the suspension fork and the heavier wheels, and a lot of these are coming with twenty nine er diameters too. That makes for a very very large wheel at four point six inch wide, four point six wide by twenty nine tall. That is a lot of weight and a lot of tire. So you're going to probably be pushing 40 pounds on these bikes. But these bikes are much more fun to ride. And uh, the fit, if you're on very rough trails, these are definitely the way to go. Very rough, rocky trails. But that's kind of the hard pack rocky trails I ride around here. The big, wide, soft tires are make, uh, make riding out there much easier. Where normally after two hours on a trail... I've been beat up so bad from the vibrations that I just want to get off. These fatter tire bikes will keep you out there all day. And that's the last bike I have on the uh, list here. It has been a this has been a very very long video. So what I'm going so I am including uh, a little YouTube. Uh, timestamps so you can go directly to the uh, bike category you're interested in. I'm sorry for the long video, but uh, by the time I explained everything, it took this long. <laughs> so here we go with another video. I hope, uh, hope you can make it through this long video. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for the next one. See you.